Thank you, Ron. Uh, Dan is not here, but I wanted to thank him for heroic, like, apparently, three-hour marathon. And I also wanted to thank you for staying and sticking for such a long day. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Dan for this fantastic homework idea that Mike just raised. Uh, and I wanted to make a disclosure. I had a learning breakdown at the second slide of Dan's lecture today. And it's not Dan's fault. It is my fault, because I'm twice slower than you are. And sometimes ideas do not come to me easily. But there was another little problem. Mike, you just raised it. There was letter H here. And the size of H was too small for I, my eye. And as a result, I got another learning breakdown and could not follow that. How many of you today understood everything that was presented? Nobody? So each of you had a learning breakdown at some point. Similar to my, it makes me feel better. Each of you had learning breakdown at some point, right? OK. And how many of you had the learning breakdown while preparing the flip class that I had? Ask how many people prepared it. You had learning breakdown. Yeah, good question. How many people actually prepared the flip class? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But you failed. You failed preparing this flip class because flip class assumes that you provide feedback to me as an instructor. Because if you, and oh, by the way, among 10 people who prepared the flip class, how many of you experienced a learning breakdown that remained unaddressed during your flip class? Sorry. Nobody, you. Understand what the learning breakdown was. So I didn't quite understand that concept yesterday when I was trying to prepare. Define learning breakdown. Yes. Learning breakdown is the following thing. Learning breakdown, particularly in complex disciplines like mathematics or computer science, is when you go through lecture, like I then I went through a lecture, I had a learning breakdown at some point, even though I teach this material as well. Uh, when you go through the lecture, you go through the book, or you go through the research talk, and you fail to understand the speaker. As a result, since it's not history of mid uh, Middle Ages, but mathematics or computer science, you miss. If I miss, fail to understand slide two, most likely I fail to understand slide three, and I fail to understand the rest of the lecture. That's what's called learning breakdown. Did you experience it? I must have. Not sure at which point exactly. Okay, but I'm I'm very proud. Nobody experienced, except for you maybe, right? <laughs> experienced a learning breakdown in my flipped class, which means that we should stop and go home. What should we do today? So what is, what is the proposal? I, since there is no learning breakdown, everything is clear. I achieved my goal. Yes, you have. I can just ask a question. Which is, Go ahead. I mean, it was, it was just at the end of the lecture, which, which, because of that, it was uh, talked about a lot. But Could you speak a little bit more yeah, loudly? So, so de dealing with errors. What if there is some errors? Right? And if there is just a little bit about, um, well, then you sort somehow. There are various methods to, to deal with this, but um, so that in the lectures there wasn't more to discuss this in detail, but I would like to learn more about it. Good, good question, but it doesn't make sense for me to answer it because sure. most people in the class did not even take the flipped class, right? Now, why you didn't take the flipped class? Because you think that online, online classes is kind of junk food of education, right? <laughs> Because when I show up in the class and present a lecture, it is completely different personal experience of connecting with this teacher. You can ask questions, and it's just much better, right? Make sense? Well, I actually totally agree with you. I think that 
took your class when it was offered, I sent my entire lab to take your class. So I tagged along. My students, um, I think two of them, survived until the very end. Uh -huh. And they were laughing at my code. Too many layers. So I dropped out midway. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I have to be honest. So I think it's really, really good for for the hands-on part. And I was submitting homework can't get from getting rejected. Right. So there are, a few, there are a few things we can do today. I see like at least four possibilities. Possibility one, we go home since there are no learning breakdown. Possibility two, I give a lecture on genome assembly in class. Possibility three, let me explain why I won't do this. You want to hear why I won't do this? Let me, no? OK. <laughs> uh, possibility three, I can basically explain why the traditional way, my view, the traditional way I taught for all my career and that we were exposed to, including myself, of all my life, I think it is junk food of education. And I think that there is a much superior way to learn and teach. And in the last three years, I basically invested thousands of hours into turning my teaching into this new way. And it is against my principles to give a classroom lecture. I can give research lecture. I haven't done it. I, I teach classes at UCSD as a regular professor. In the last three years, I haven't given a single lecture. Okay. The performance of students in my classes significantly improved, probably because I'm a bad teacher and my lectures were bad in the first place. But uh, that's why when Ron told me, I originally thought that this boot camp will be about more research-driven things. When Ron told me it should be basically classroom lecture, I told Ron, sorry, I don't give classroom lecture anymore. I think it is counterproductive. I think it's junk for the predicate. So they can, I, I can explain, if you're interested, why I think the way we currently teach represent junk food of education. Or if you want, I can give more kind of research driven lecture. For example, I noticed we will all have a fantastic conference on computational cancer biology. I noticed that in this conference, we hardly talk about the past from past uh, toward anti cancer drugs. We talk a lot about what's happening in cancer, how genome sequencing relate and illuminate our cancer studies, but we don't even touch on the question how genome sequencing can lead to new anti cancer drugs. That sounds good. I and I can give this type of research. So suggest whatever you want. Yeah, research. Research. But research? But let's vote. Let's vote. Who wants to go home? Nobody? Okay. Giving lecture uh, uh, in the class about genome assembly is not an option. Who wants to hear why I hate traditional classroom lectures? No? Good. So let's go to research lectures. Let's make it easy. Oh, you want to hear why I think traditional classroom lecture is junk food? It depends how long you are. Um, uh, yeah. um, Two minutes. Two minutes. No, it takes 50 minutes at okay, least. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, and who wants to hear research lecture? So I think we'll go for research lecture. You've got this almost religious position that you've taken. And I'm, I've become very wary of people who are 100% sure of anything. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I've watched too many uh, uh, presidential debates recently. <laughs> <laughs> people know exactly. Yeah. And come on, give me a break. You well, won't be 100% right. Of course, I cannot sure. be 100% right, but as all presidential candidate, I'm at liberty to express my position on, on this matter. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's let's then go. Let's then go to uh, how people. Yes. Before you jump into that, can I ask another question? Say again. So I'm curious about how you run flip classes, and one of the questions I would have about that would be, what do you do when you show up to class and nobody's done the homework? Okay, my class works like this. I request students to learn all the material before the class. 
and do homework before the class. I view my lecture time is too important and too precious to give a speech in the class. I want to communicate with students in the class, know them by name, learn how they think. If I spend 50 minutes or 45 minutes even, allowing five minutes for question in my class, it means they don't know me. They can press a button and uh, just listen to all my lectures, right? I walk in the class and I ask students, show me your thumb. If they show thumb like this, it means they understood everything by 100%. This is zero. And this is everything in between. And then I point to the student and I ask, what is your learning breakdown? Students should formulate their learning breakdown before the lecture. Students ask a question in the class. I rate the quality of the questions asked. And students who understood everything answer this question. So the class is completely dialogue-based and engage many students. So that's, that's roughly how I run my class. And I can run it for a class of, I try it for, the class, for a class of 70 students. I don't know whether it's scalable for more, but it's definitely scalable for up to 100 students. And this is not my idea. That's how Google boot camps are run. So what's the incentive of the good students to come to class? I give them points for class participation or for the questions asked or for the questions answered. It's 20% of their grade. What's the incentive in a normal lecture? No, you, you don't need to come. If you know everything, just take the exam and you get the perfect Ron, time. I have almost 100% attendance in my classes. Okay, because attendance and participation is part of the grade. Yes. Yeah. So that's a pretty good incentive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. of course. Anyway, should we start to be more kind of, it's, it won't be really a research lecture, but at least uh, more advanced than classroom lecture. Uh, okay. Uh, John Dallas is a best selling. Soft tissue sarcoma drug. It is isolated from C squared, and 1,000 kilogram of C squared are needed to isolate one gram of Yondelis. A lot of damage to nature. Turn out, Yondelis is not at fault. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, C squared is not at fault. It's not produced by the C squared. It's produced by a non-ribosomal <coughs> peptide that generated by symbiotic bacterium living on uh, C squared. And David Sherman made this breakthrough discovery uh, explaining what is actually producing Viridelius. Why is it important? Because the early dose of Yondelis cost roughly $50,000. If we are able to synthesize this elusive compound, it cost may be reduced to $20. However, how can we do this? There are hundreds of bacterial species living on C squares, which one produces Yondelis. And here, genome sequencing comes in. Are we able to solve this problem today with all advances in genome sequencing? Unfortunately not. And I'm going to talk about this. Now, Yondelis is just one example of anti-cancer drug that is, represents so-called natural products. Drugs that are basically borrowed from nature, like antibiotics. And when we talk about anti-cancer drug, we usually bring poster example of Glivic that works uh, on Philadelphia chromosome, right? But the most popular anti-cancer, more than 50% of anti-cancer drugs are drugs like Yandelis, drugs extracted from natural products. They are produced either by bacteria or yeast. Sometimes they are produced by plants. And the question is, how is it done? And what we can learn from nature to greatly increase this spectrum of drugs that already accounts for 50% of anti-cancer drugs, more than 50% of anti-cancer drugs. And it brings us back to Frederick Sanger, who actually got two Nobel Prizes. Everybody knows about his Nobel Prize for DNA sequencing. But, in fact, many years ago, his first Nobel Prize 
was gained for protein sequencing. And amazingly enough, the idea of assembly was somewhat similar. Also, at that time, the assembly method was not really developed. Everything was done by hand. We have amazing advances in DNA sequencing that you will definitely cover. We have really, really slow advances in protein sequencing. Protein sequencing remains very expensive and time-consuming process today. And I, in this talk, I won't talk about protein sequencing. I talk only about genome sequencing. But it's important to keep in mind that when things come to drugs, it is very important to move from DNA to protein and see how this transition goes. Make sense? OK, this is my talk from genome sequencing to drug discovery. And by drug discovery, I limit my attention to only specific type of drugs, drugs that are produced by nature. And I'm interested only in one particular type of this drug, peptidic products, peptides, or protein, so made from amino acids. Uh, and this year Nobel Prize was given exactly for products like this. This is an amazing story. UU2 got Nobel Prize with his Hirsch index equal to 2. She hardly published any research papers. And you notice that these are people who started working quite some time ago. And it reflects the very slow pace of discovery in this field. It's very time consuming. Now, how possibly UU2 can discover anything in 1967 in China during the Cultural Revolution? The story goes like this. In 1967, Ho Chi Minh soldiers were dropping dead at the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It was malaria-infested pathway. And Ho Chi Minh asked Mao Zedong to develop anti-malaria drug. Mao Zedong set up a secret research project on developing malaria drug in 1967, and UU2 was sent to southern China to malaria-infested area to do research on this on malaria anti-malaria drug. Her husband, of course, was sent to the countryside to labor camp, and her daughter was sent to orphanage. So she started working, and she found 4th century ancient Chinese medicine manuscript where this particular plant, I forgot the name, was linked to treatment of malaria. He made us, uh, was supposed, hot extraction, tested it, and it didn't work. It didn't stop her. She continued reading. Another fourth century manuscript hinted that heart instruction is bad because it kills active ingredients. Maybe it makes sense to make cold water extraction. She tried cold water extraction, tried it on herself, and it worked. And that's how Chinese anti-malaria drugs that eventually got Nobel Prize was developed. Uh, so what I will be talking about in this talk, I will be talking about genomics and genome sequencing in particular. But it's important to realize that drugs only will come in the play if all these different fields play together synergetically. And I will be focusing on this metabolomics aspect of this. But metabolomics, I mean peptidic product. Why it is so difficult to sequence them? Well, because they're very exotic peptides not the peptides that we kind of studied in traditional biology book. Let me give you an example of just one of such peptides, also natural product. So this is theta defensive. It's 18 amino acid long cyclic peptide, which represent a concatenate of nine amino acid long peptides from two different proteins. In what biology book you read about cutting exactly at the exact position two peptides from different proteins and then magically from two different ones concatenating them together. What enzymes do this work? It's a very important antimicrobial, antiviral peptide because it prevents viruses from entering cell and has anti-HIV activity. This is not good news. It's bad news. 
is that macaques and baboons have it, but we don't. And we and chimpanzee don't. And uh, what happened? So this is a RTD1A and RTD1B are these two proteins from which this nine amino acid long segments are extracted. Some million years ago, there was a mutation in human that introduces stop codon right before this nine amino acid long peptide in one of them. As a result, peptide is not being produced. We lost the ability to make cytokine defense, and it is actually linked to more rampant HIV inf in, uh, infection in human. Is it clear what happened? It, was, it used to be a gene. It is a gene in macaque. But there was a mutation that changed something into stop codon. It turned into pseudogen. OK? So why, why was that fixed? What's the evolutionary story for why that was allowed to hang around? Exactly. I'll come to this. So this, is, this seems extremely counterproductive for human, extremely unfortunate for human. And the question is, can we get say, the defensive back? It turns out that we can. Because there are drugs that actually allows ribosome to move through stop codon and continue translating. OK? And in this way, it was shown that with treatment of this drug, we get our cytodefensive back. Now, here comes the most interesting part of the story. Obviously, since we can't get cytodefensive back, all this amazing machinery that cuts peptide and glues them together, make turn peptide into cyclic, exist in humans. Or what for? If it is a single site of defensive that we need and unfortunately lost, it should deteriorate. Mike Selstead from, UC, from USC, who actually found site of defense in 50 years ago, thinks there are 100 such peptides. That amazingly complex, exotically built peptide in human. But there is no way for us to see them today. Why? For many different reasons. Mass spectrometry doesn't see a single cyclic peptide. They are invisible to mass spectrometry. How can you figure out what is the database to search this peptide against? You have, you have to try every pair of possible peptide from the human genome. So this is examples that represent the complexity of searching for these natural products. And example of importance of searching for them. Let me tell you a little bit about the first mass-produced natural product, and it's not penicillin. The first mass-produced natural product is gramicide, gramicide in Soviet, which was discovered in 1942. It looks like this. It doesn't look like a traditional cyclic peptide, linear peptide. It's cyclic. Uh, and used in Soviet hospital a year before invasion of Normandy. Uh, and Gauzy got Stalin Prize that probably saved, most likely saved him from prosecution of geneticists by Lysenko. He was the only one in Russia in 1950s, along with his nuclear physicist, who could openly speak against Lysenko. So when Labrenti Beria came to Stalin and told him that physicists, leading physicists and biologists like Gauzy openly speak about Lysenko, Stalin told him, make sure that our scientists have everything needed to do their job and edit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's do test. Let's play flip class. Let's do test. I'll tell you that this ter terasidin just another name similar. This single bacteria, Bacillus brevis, generate 28 ty different types of antibiotics, single one. Production of this type of antibiotics of anti-cancer drug is usually take the largest genomic footage in the genome. They are giant machineries and very complex involved. I can tell you that for Bacillus brevis, machinery producing this single peptide takes more space in nucleotide than the whole ribosome. Okay? It's extremely important for life of bacteria. So this is the sequence, OK? I take the sequence of amino acids, and I run it against the genome to find 
who vote at 10 cadres in coding these 10 nominations. Let's do this. We run it, and we failed. What happened? Why did we fail to find this 10 cadons in coding this 10 nominations? Well, modification. Uh, no, I, there is no modification here. Cyclic, good. So we should try everything starting from this, consider all cyclic shifts, right? And try all of them. I didn't have patience to show all 10 experiments like this, we will also fail. It looks like these 10 cadons disappeared from the genome. What happened? What can possibly happen? Yes. Errors in the data? No. No errors in the data. It's like model organisms. Everything is sequenced perfectly. Stop coding in the middle. The no the stop coding in the middle. Editing? RNA editing? What? RNA editing? No RNA editing. Two peptides? Link no two. A single peptide. Okay. Chemically, it's not um, translated from an RNA copy. Yeah. From where? Where it's translated from? It's not translated from anything. You just have um, synthetic enzymes in place. To... Perfect. We are coming. Thank you for helping me. So let me explain you how amazing story of how these drugs, anti-cancer drug and antibiotics, are really built. So they are raised on the central dogma. DNA makes RNA, makes proteins. There is no other way in biology book to assemble amino acids into proteins, right? Edward Tatum, 63, got Nobel Prize, inhibits ribosome in Bacillus brevis. Production of this peptide continues. How can it be? Here comes interesting scent. On the top of central dogma, there is another very important process called non-ribosomal peptide sequencing, synthesis. Some protein, there are giant protein that have ability to synthesize other proteins without any help of ribosome, without any cardons. There are proteins that encode amino acids in another protein. These are giant molecular machines whose only goal to make yet another peptide. And that's why, of course, tyrosidin is not encoded in the genome. It's indirectly encoded in this giant protein. Does it make sense? We all were exposed to this protein big time, starting from uh, penicillin, another uh, drug. There is huge array. This type of drugs count not just 50% of anti-cancer drugs. They count for more than 60% of all drugs. This was the most successful type of drugs ever invented by human, actually borrowed by human. And antibiotics is the most famous example, but anti-tumor agents like bleomycin, there are many, many of them. Okay? So, but how is it done? How protein can make another protein? And this, I think, is another, that was discovered 15 years ago. I think it's another Nobel Prize waiting to happen. Mohamed Marhel made uh, decode amazing puzzle, much more complex than decoding genetic code. Let me briefly tell you how it is done. There is a giant protein that may consist of 60,000, encoded by 60,000 nucleotides or longer, the longest known proteins. Uh, and this uh, giant, it represents a giant molecular assembly line. It contains, suppose we want to, to synthesize a protein consisting of 10 amino acids. It consists of 10 domains called adenylation domain or A domains. And these domains, one after another, slowly synthesize adding amino acids to each other, 10 amino acid long chain, and finally we turn it into cyclic. Okay? And, and bacteria often spend like 3 4% of the entire genome doing this. It's enormous investment of energy. And uh, how is it done? There is amazing non ribosomal code. If you take this A demands, coding for different amino acids, you align them to it against each other, and you uh, ingeniously know 
of what columns to look at. And here are eight important columns, all other columns are not important. Then this eight amino acid long code will code just for one amino acid. Okay. The code kind of was cracked initially by Marahiel. There are still active research, evolution of this code, how it uh, turns, how to adapt, remains completely very, very open question. Okay. So what it has to do with this? What's ORN? That's not a peptide. What? What's ORN? That's not a regular peptide. Good point. So they often think that there are 20 amino acids. There are 300 of amino acids. So just there are 20 protein, proteinogenic amino acids. Ribosomal. Right, ribosomal, but the right ornithine is just one of the most popular non-standard amino acids. Okay? Uh, and roughly maybe 20, 30 percent of amino acids in this peptide are non-standard. Okay, what it has to do? How does it relate to drug discovery? And in the last few years, the following pipeline emerges. That ha like when you talk to natural product researcher, and when they talk about drug discovery, spending three years on simply decoding non-ribosomal peptide is considered normal. It's extremely slow process. It's much faster to sequence, I don't know, mammal maybe already mammalian genome today than to sequence a single peptide like this. So, what do we do? What currently, what is this pipeline? Generate mass spectra and reads, assemble genome from reads, identify context containing this molecular machine and RP synthesizers, use this ingenious non-ribosomal code to predict what particular peptide this machine generates, and then use software to match spectra against this predicted code and that's what my lab have been doing probably for seven, for almost eight years now. And we are nowhere close to resolving this challenge. So let me explain why it is really a challenge. Uh, actually, we started research just seven years ago. It was our first paper on the topic. So the challenge come from, Yon Delis is an example of the challenge. You have to assemble, there are all these, these drugs are produced by bacterial communities. These are not, typically not cultivatable bacteria. You have to assemble metagenome or single cell. Make sense? And then in metagenome or single cell, you have to identify a context containing an RP synthetases. Good luck with that. Because NRP synthetases just core of this is 60,000 nucleotide long. Where did you see metagenomic assembly that has context of the size 100 KB? So it is, it is maybe captured, but it is fragmented. As soon as it is fragmented, it is useless for me. I cannot connect my spec with this, uh, this NRP synthesis, and as a result, I cannot confirm any drug. Is it clear what is the challenge? The challenge is how to make metagenomics assembly or single cell assembly to turn back complete genomes, essentially. And this is one of the major bottleneck in this line of research now. That's, this, is, this figure is, for me, it was completely shocking. Because when I started working in this area, this Antibiotics natural product discovery was one of the last bastions of life sciences, practically untouched by any computational algorithm. Innocent, completely innocent field. And then David Sherman, the guy who worked on Oyendelis, published a review and he showed what it takes. Like it's basically everything here, metagenomic, metagenomic, single cell, metabolomics, all parts of modern kind of, of different modern fields come together and they have to come together for it to work. They all should work. I will only work, talk to you, start talking about single cell thing and this part. I won't talk about other part because this is about genome assembly basically. Okay? So uh, four years ago, I started single cell 
uh, development of single cell assembler. I was actually on sabbatical in St. Petersburg, and uh, that was a desert. There was no single bioinformatics seminar or course in the city of five million. So I came for my sabbatical and uh, I found this very, very talented guys who came from algebra, theoretical computer science, and other fields that are not well suited. The only thing that kind of united them, they all were fantastic programmers. And I uh, gave them presumably unsolvable task to develop a new assembler within a year. And all indications were that they would fail, but they actually succeeded and they developed space assemblers that became very popular. Uh, and in the last year, we were focusing on scaling this assembler for many different applications, and Meta is here. Meta is just one of these applications. And uh, I wanted to tell you about these challenges. So this looks like an advertisement. This is actually the first collaborative paper of this lab that they published just like in one and a half year after the lab was formed. Looks like advertisement of bathroom equipment but in reality, it is indeed cover of genome research, and it is about sequencing bacteria in hospitals. This is a huge problem, because we can only sequence bacteria that are cultivated. If you want to cultivate, it takes time. How to make it instant check of what is going on in hospitals? And that was uh, basically our first paper uh, uh, done with Venter Institute. Uh, and why is this assembly of single cell is challenging? I wanted to explain and it kind of clarify what needed to be done in spades. There is order of magnitude difference in coverage in single cell project due to artifacts of amplifications. And existing assemblers implicitly or explicitly assume that coverage is uniform like this, like coverage is 600 along the entire genome. And here coverage varies by three order of magnitude. Talking about terrors, when coverage varies, you lose your ability to distinguish errors from true segments. Right. So uh, we actually figured out how to do this in 2011. And then there were Spades and IDBA UD from University of Hong Kong that kind of further developed this. And this is a solved problem. We know how to deal with this project with this varying color. What is more difficult project is chimeric reads. And chimeric reads in single cell projects may be two order of magnitude more frequent than in normal projects. This is a difficult algorithmic problem that will require flows and networks, careful analysis of large graphs, and uh, that is basically implementing this was one of the reasons spades become successful because we also learned that there are quite a number of chimeric reads in normal projects. And usual assemblers don't pay, don't pay attention and deserve to this difficult phenomenon, to this type of edges. So we started, as I said, with screening pathogens in the hospital and found amazing arrays of pathogens in a bathroom of a very good hospital in San Diego. Uh, uh, not only we found them, we demonstrated that by single cell sequencing, we can assemble nearly complete genomes. This is 90% of coverage, detecting variation in CRISPR. There are many things you can learn just from a single cell. No time to grow the culture. Then we started looking, we're looking at revealing the micro, in a, in microbial uh, uh, dark matter of life in a different paper. And currently, more than half of bacteria clades never saw a sequence. They remain unsequenced because it cannot be cultivated. One of this important clade is called TM6. It is everywhere. It's from the perspective of 16S RNA. Nobody was able to sequence it in the last 20 years. And we were able to capture and sequence this genome. They introduced the approach called mini metagenome, when we collect 100 single cells arbitrarily, or 100 fluorescent events, make a mixture, and try to sequence all the genome at once. So this is the approach 
that sometimes work, sometimes doesn't work, but we demonstrated for TM6 it worked. We captured it, it's genome, 90% of all genes from this completely previously unknown genome was uh, reconstructed. And recently, we completely closed a single cell genome, which is basically uh, probably the only case for single cell genome closing. There are many excited, I got very excited in collaborations on this project because in many exotic places, there is no way to go ahead but with these single cells. And this is Doug Barlett who directed James Cameron expedition. We process first batch on this data, but we don't, still don't have, this is from Puerto Rico trench, we still don't have deep sea expedition. Bacteria are still in pipeline. And of course, we've worked on natural products and anti-cancer drug with various researchers. But this is single cells. This is uh, relatively simple. Let me talk in the remaining time about what to do with metagenome, something that I view as a huge challenge. Uh, so, but before, let me tell you what spades. Spades is, of course, deep brain graph assembler. And if you would cover the flip class, you would know this. But I'm sure in this audience, everybody knows it anyway. Uh, and. There was no shortage of De Bruyne assemblers when we started working on spades. The only problem was that none, none of them worked on single cell data because of these artifacts. And as you know, assembler is a rather complex algorithmic and software implementation challenge. And we basically rewrote all of all models of assembly and implemented them. And there are very exciting algorithmic challenges uh, in well-defined uh, computational problems, something that I don't have time to talk about here. Then we tried it on single cell. And no surprise, it greatly outperformed conventional assembler. So spades uh, is now method, default method of choice for assembling single cells. And it is amazing in 2000. When we started like four or five years ago, we were working with these top biologists in the world to get access to a single cell data set. Now there are thousands of single cells being sequenced every month. So, and then when we applied to standard multi cell data set, we were pleasantly surprised to see that it actually outperformed with this relatively small margin, but still outperformed the standard assemblers. Why? Because there are actually some variation in coverage, because there are chimeric reads, and we pay attention to this. And then we decided during the, uh, the last couple of years to transform spades into universal assembler. For, there are 10 different types of assembly, and different tools are used for different types of assembly. So we tried for RNA assembly and for all other types of assembly, but I will focus attention to metagenomics assembly, because this is more, most relevant to my interest in natural products. And basically, red line here is spades. And this is cumulative lens of n longest contacts in the assembly. So if you take contacts, order them from longest to shortest, and compute so for 20,000 longest contact account for 300 megabases here. And very quickly, we learned that actually spades improved on existing assembler. And the more complex is the data set, the more dramatic is the quality. This is dramatic quality. And assembly soil data sets are typically very complex. Why is it happening? Actually, it was not a surprise for us. Because metagenomics data set feature enormous variation in coverage. And we spent two years preparing to deal with this variation in coverage. There are chimeric reads, all type of artifacts. And afterwards, we started developing many branching into many different types of assembly. For example, actually, the first co-assembly of PugBio and Oxford nanopore reads with Illumina were done with spades. More, uh, model called hybrid spades. But in the remaining, whatever remaining 10 minutes, I will talk about recent very exciting development, should be 2016 here, uh, which is true spades. Who heard about 
true centennial clone creates a new technology from Illumina? One person. Okay, then I will explain. Two. Okay, then I, I will explain how it works. So you all know about long creeds. They are long but inaccurate. That have 15% error rate. Illumina today generates long read, 10 KB long, that have error rate that is 150 times smaller than the error rate in pack by reads. So let me explain how it works. Imagine, uh, imagine that you can break your genome into let's say human genome, into 10 KB pieces, then collect, once again randomly, 300 of these 10 KB pieces, and assign them a single barcode. So you take 10 KB random pieces from human genome, 300 of them, and they are barcoded together. Afterwards, you don't need to assemble the whole genome. You only need to assemble a single barcode, right? And that's what you do. So this, instead of like all set of reads, your reads are separated into barcodes. It's Illumina reads. And after you assemble this barcode, you got virtual reads that explain this barcode. Right. So uh, single barcode assembly is essentially assembly of 310 KB long segments. The total length is three megabases. How different it is from assembling a bacterial genome of size three megabase. So we, due to this technology, we suddenly reduce a very complex problem of analyzing human genome from Illumina reads to a problem of analyzing single barcodes and Illumina generate many, many barcodes in a single experiment. Okay. In a single experiment, they cover one billion nucleotides, actually sort of the human gene. And why Spades is a good assembler for this? <laughs> Here's an illustration. So for single cell, if you look at single cell, and you look how many positions in the genome have coverage 50, have coverage 100, have coverage 25. Coverage is everywhere. In difference from Standard assembly where coverage almost everywhere is 200, right? I will show you, so take a look at this, and I will show you here how the coverage for barcode assembly look like. It's almost like identical picture. So we knew already how to deal with this. That's why we were applying this, and there are unique interstrand chimeric challenges in this assembly that are caused by amplification artifacts. We also we had two years to prepare for dealing with this. It doesn't mean that we had nothing to do developing this. There are quite special, true synthetic clone creates artifacts that have to be taken into account. It took us one year to develop the assembly. Here's the results. But let me digest it for you because there are too many numbers. 80% of the span of the barcode is covered by virtual reads of lens at least 1.5 KB. 40% of all 10 KB segments that were generated during the protocol result in virtual reads of lens at least 8 KB. Small number of assembly errors that we can verify through human genome and extremely high accuracy of base calling 10 times more accurate than standard Illumina reads. Okay? So you park at 310 KB. Yes. It's the human genome. So you've got 3 million. No, no, no. 300 segments, each of lens 10 KB. Over a lens is 3 million nucleotides. It's a tiny portion of human genome. It's only 1,000 of the human genome. So we have single barcode. 300 segments. Your barcode, but just randomly grabbing these pieces. Yes. So they're all over the place. They're all over the place, right? But so you have 300. So you can do the assembly. You can't get too many assembly. I, I think that's what's why I'm confused. Okay. So I'm currently talking about 
assembly of a single barcode as a way to generate long reads, long virtual reads. So I have 300, 10 KB, which is three megabase. Exactly. It's a small. One one thousandth of the. Of the right. Of right. So how many of those over? I mean, oh, how many of those I generate? Yeah, how, in a, how much do you get out of this? In a single experiment. So and I, but this is not all. So I actually generated Illumina read for barcode. And instead of Illumina original short reads, I generate, let's say, 150 long, let's say, 8 KB reads. But simply assembling this small genome with a barcode. A single Illumina kit has 384 barcodes, which account for a third of the human genome. So a single experiment generates this 8 KB rates, somewhat sample in a, from this rate in a, a single experiment. I'll talk later. I'm, I'm missing something. OK. OK. So uh, but an easy way to think about this, think, forget about how barcodes are generated. This technology will generate for you in a single experiment, huge number or free it. Most of them are 8 KB long and extremely, in each of them is extremely accurate. So it's, if we, we want to just abstract from experimental details, we randomly sample from the genome 8 KB segments. It does, they do not cover human genome entirely, they cover only third, so you need probably to run this 10 times. But you don't have like crazy 100x coverage of human genome because the reads are so long and so accurate, right? You probably will be with this significant modest coverage according to Lander Waterman formula since the reads are so long and so accurate, we probably will be okay with coverage 5x for this type of reads because they're so long. But according to your numbers, let's assume every, you get everything. So one, ex, one experiment gives you three megabases. So mm -hmm. you need a thousand experiments just to get one X. That's one one thousandth of the coverage. Yeah. So I don't understand how any of them overlap. Okay. In a single experiment, in a single kit, you don't do a single barcode. You do 384 different barcode. But you talked about assembling each barcode and then going on from there, and I don't see how any barcode I'm, gets much assembly. I'm currently talking only about generating virtual reads. I'm not talking about taking these virtual reads and making assembly out of these virtual reads. It will be coming later. So I'm, I'm simply That's talking true. about a new technology to generate virtual reads from human genome. I'm not talking about assembling this virtual read into the genome. And I don't have currently aspiration to assemble it. I have a different aspiration that I will explain. Uh, I think I. Anyway, so. Any anything I can any I can question I can answer? Well, I was just saying if, if this was a flip class, I would be the guy who was. <laughs> my fault, my fault, right? But Mike, in flip class, it would be perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be complaining about speaking with you already for 50 minutes, being exhausted, and I didn't even speak for three hours. Okay, here's the result, and everybody who worked with these metagenomics assemblers realize that this is amazing. So uh, Chris Dupont and other metagenomics people at Venter Institute are drooling over this data. Mike Snyder just published a paper uh, in Nature Biotech with his first metagenomics assembly. These are some total quantic lenses, 5 KB, there are that many quantics of this lens. So we get pieces of metagenomic assemblies that are as good sometimes better than assembly of cultivated genomes. From metagenomics assemblies with hundreds of genomes in the sample. Why I'm, like, 
uh, we are excited about this is that look at this cumulative lens of all contexts, of all reads, virtual reads, from different uh, uh, species, just to give you a reference point for human metagenome, in a single experiment, 150,000 long reads this total lens 826 uh, megabases. Some people don't even want to assemble them further. It's already an amazing amount of information. But of course, we assemble them. And when we assemble them, so I am not going to talk how to assemble these reads because it's trivial. It's very accurate long reads. And uh, that's what we get with this for cumulative lens of long context. And uh, why Chris is excited is because the novelty is captured from rare species, because it has, and uh, this is like for human microbiome, which is extremely well studied genome, 18 beans, which means 18 genomes in the mixture, will visit more 75% identity to known genome. What do you mean a genome? Uh, it's a contig or it's a? Bean, so in, in metagenomic slinger, when I give them assembly, I give context. They need to figure out which context go together. And in the last five years, they were using binning approaches that basically look, let's say, at tetranucleotide composition or coverage or whatever to figure out. So presumably, if Chris is correct, these 80 bins are 18 new genomes, individual genomes in human metagen. And in Baltic Sea, it's just an enormous diversity. But I am excited about a different slide. This is, this is what I am excited. Yes? So basically, you didn't be in before, in the reads before assembly. You just been in the uh, context after assembly. They've been in context after. Chris been in context after assembly. And the true uh, spades use the overlap-based approach or the brain? Uh, true spades to true spades use deep brain graph approach. There are two parts for true spades. First, assembly context from a single barcode. Then, after you generated virtual reads, assembling these virtual reads into complete genomes. For both parts, we use the brain graph assembly. Anyway, this is my most exciting thing. This is these are just code words for different type of natural products. This is a very Important antibiotics, anti-cancer drugs, lantipeptides is we eat it every day. Sounds like lantipeptide nisin, we eat every day because it's uh, one of the most common food preservatives. Safe. And look at the number of the same, let's say, Baltic Sea in metagenomic assembly through genome, because we know how this NRPs look like genomic makeup. Then the only thing left, finally for us to generate spectra, match the spectra to this element in the genome because it's well assembled and find how this drug actually, how this, I should say, natural product because not, not all natural products are drug. Some are simply used for communication with other bacteria. I think I'm done. I mean, there is more I can talk about, but I run out of time. There is a whole lot, uh, another section that I will just skip because we don't want to talk about this. This is general methods of integrating genomics and proteomics that is necessary, but we will skip it also. Uh, so these are important people that currently participate in this project. And these are people from SPADES team that were responsible for different aspects of developing SPADES. And these are our collaborators who are a lot of fun to work with. That's it. I think I almost, yeah, I'm almost on time. Yeah. Questions? It looks like everything clean and no learning breakdowns. <laughs> Question about something at the very beginning. It's not about the core of what you were talking about. Yeah. So, if other people have more relevant questions, 
But uh, at the very beginning, you said that 50% of all anti-cancer drugs that we know that we have come from these natural proteins. Now, I natural products. Some of them are not proteins. Oh. Some of them are, uh, I don't know, lipids or whatever. Okay. So I'm thinking evolutionarily. I mean, I can understand how antibacterials evolved or antivirals evolved. Anti-cancer, is this just a fluke? Or is there really some evolutionary? I mean, I don't, I'm not aware of plants getting cancer. It's definitely, it's definitely a fluke of nature. So what are these products? These are molecular bullets that have often have very general purpose action. For example, drill the membrane. And when, like these guys, they basically they dive in the most exotic places in the world, in Papua New Guinea, they collect uh, samples, and then they have panels. And they're actually most interested in anti-cancer drug of cancer cells and uh, normal cells. And the thing they're looking for is uh, whether these guys kill cancer cells more quickly than normal cells. And they have this therapeutic window notion, let's say, if they find something that kills cancer cell 1,500 times faster than normal cell, they're excited. And they go to, often go to us and ask to decode this and invest effort further. But they have no clue in the beginning why it kills cancer cells. What's the answer? For many, for many of them, it is not known. For example, I don't exactly know what is bleomycin mechanism of action. And so we will Famous, famous drugs. What is terror? Famous anti cancer drug that actually goes back to 1960s. That became the most scandalous drugs in the world because it was uh, destined and as a miracle drug uh, against. against some, I, I mean, I, I, I don't remember correctly. And then it led in deformities in pregnant women. And the drug, you, you remember my? Yeah. And then it led to deformities. Talidomide. And it was shelved. It was shelved completely. And then in the last 10 years, it became once again multi-billion dollar drug because it had, if it applied properly and uh, to certain people, it actually works very well. So mechanism was not known for this drug, for uh, uh, definitely when it was discovered, it wasn't known. Okay. But the reason they look for them in, by diving in, in New Guinea, as opposed to just digging in the backyard, is it's much more fun. No, no. The reason they look, most of natural products today come from the ocean, and there is a very natural explanation for this. The diversity of life in the ocean is by an order of magnitude higher than diversity of life on Earth, at least here. Maybe at Borneo Island there is some competition, but they basically go to the most diverse parts of the world to search for this uh, compound. And the reason that there's more diversity in the ocean is because there's less mixing? Uh, or because civilization is more conservative? I'm not prepared to answer this question. But I'm sure if Bill Garrick was asked, he would answer. Or Leonard Garrick, they would answer. But look, look, the m most of vertebrates, as far as I know, are fish, right? There are more fish among vertebrates than any other species, probably more species than all others altogether, which tells us something. Maybe it is quite a, uh, diverse. What? Vertebrates. 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 Yeah. Okay, so thanks, Pavel. And now we know what the Lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so fascinating. So we start tomorrow at uh, nine o'clock, rise and shine, and we fly.